I have a question for you out there. When was the last time you heard someone mention arena football? It's been a minute, hasn't it? From the highs of the 2000s of multiple different cities upon multiple different star owners taking the reins of their own team to the late 1990s, where we have Kurt Warner rising from a small Des Moines, Iowa Barnstormers team up the ranks in one of the greatest underdog stories the NFL has ever seen to win a Super Bowl with the then St. Louis Rams. Arena football has been through some up and downs in its 30 plus years of history, and it's gotten some new variants along the way. I've been following this for a very short time in its relative in its relative history of sorts. My first game was in 2019 when the AFL was just on its last breath. We didn't all know it then, but it came pretty quickly. And the sport has changed drastically in just four years. Today, I do want to discuss what might be one of the most important off seasons in arena and indoor football's history that we might be witnessing right now. So today I'm bringing you a series, a two-parter. It was going to be one video, but I'm going to make a two-parter because it does have that much to discuss. And I'm calling it the silliest of seasons in arena football. We're going to be diving into the three big leagues that make up the scene. Now, now some people have a lot of questions about one in particular, and that's part of the reason why I'm leaving the second video solely on the one that has the oldest of the namings. Today, we're going to bring you part one, though, talking the Indoor Football League and the National Arena League and all of its fun facts and tidbits going through the 2023 offseason and into the beyond. Let's get started. So before diving fully into part one of our video series, I want to discuss something real quick to those that maybe maybe you're new. You know, maybe you're catching my my video on here for the first time, uh, and you are trying to figure out, hey, what arena football? What is that? Maybe you don't know. There are a lot of people that don't know what arena and indoor football is, or the differences of the two sports. And they they are certain. There are certain things that you need to know that I will point out before we get started. And they both do play different styles of game, at least in terms of what is equipment and available play calling styles as necessary. So I wanted to go into that really quick. First off, arena football is the starting point. It is the original iteration of the sport. First originally conceived in 1981, later tested in 1986 by Jim Foster himself, kind of I label as the godfather of the sport, kicking off their first season in 1987 with four teams, the Washington Commandos, the Denver Dynamite, the Chicago Bruisers, and the Pittsburgh Gladiators. That original four teams would blossom into a total of 83 teams over the course of the Arena Football League's history in its first 32 years. And just to safeguard myself from those that are a little bit more expert on the subject, when I talk about 83 particular teams in the AFL's run, I mean brands that existed and different cities that they existed in. So for example, the Iowa Barnstormers had two iterations, but the same team name. I do not count that as one, but the Cleveland Gladiators, the New Jersey Gladiators, and the Las Vegas Gladiators all to me are considered three separate teams because of the three separate locations that they were in. Some having multiple different teams over their histories. We've seen a team in Toronto, Canada, so two different countries. A Chinese Arena Football League at one point was planned out and had been spun off by the Arena Football League. And it's been through a long path. And that iteration lasted from 1987 to 2008, was rebirthed after the financial collapse and bankruptcy from the AFL in 2010 and lasted until 2019. Indoor football, which is a spin-off of arena football, many similar pre premises with the main differences being no nets. So in arena football, you have big rebound nets at the back end zones that can have the ball bounce back and be recovered by a return man or by a defender or passer if thrown off the net. 
Indoor football does not follow that and does not use nets. They use a small version of an outdoor style goalpost that hangs by cablings in the arenas. Another difference is that the play styles are a little different. If you've ever been to an arena football game, arena football is a lot heavier on passing first, running second. Running games generally are using either larger linebackers or maybe a slightly smaller scale size of linemen that are playing the game. Indoor football likes to mimic more of the outdoor aspects of what is football. You're going to see a lot more running plays in terms of maybe dives, read options. You'll see a lot more jet sweeps. Some of this stuff does exist in arena football, but indoor football has always been focused more on the outdoor concepts and trying to fit that into a 50-yard field with the padding, whereas arena has tried to be its own style entirely. So when I talk about these two styles, I do want to mention that they are different. The rules are even different, too. I could go into depth a bit more, and I might do separate videos on that. But for the time being, that is the basics you need to know as to what the differences are. But they both are the same in terms of the 50-yard turf indoor and arena based sport that we most that we have come to love especially the diehards that have come to love this so to get this party started i'm going to start with the one that has lasted the longest in the indoor football league and boy has it exploded in terms of what it has done to grow its Portfolio. The IFL, and I mean this in terms of the grand scheme of the three leagues that will be discussed in this two-part series, is the best-known brand in terms of longest engagement with fans. It is the best in terms of representing itself publicly that I have seen, and it's done a great job doing the little things correctly. And what do I mean? Well, if you watch any modern professional sport, what does a professional sports organization need? You need to have good PR. You need to have good social media marketing, graphic design, video highlights, and you need to present yourself as professional and as stable as possible. And this is one word, if you ever want to look into the arena and indoor scene as a fan community, stability is the name of the game. And it is the most powerful tool in your arsenal if you want to follow along with this sport. Go on to arenafan.com and go to the team section. You'll see teams have come and gone. Not all of them are gone. In the IFL in particular, we have three of the main brands that are most famous from the arena football days that moved on to the IFL, including the Arizona Rattlers, the recently added Jacksonville Sharks, and the Iowa Barnstormers, which is arguably one of the most well-known brands because that is the brand that Kurt Warner played under. It is not the same ownership of that Barnstormers, keep that in mind, but that brand is most synonymous with arena football and the Kurt Warner story that helped propel arena football more into the, pul into the cultural zeitgeist it was in the late 90s and the mid 2000s. So the Eiffel has established brands like those three. It has established cities across the country. Its portfolio does range from East Coast to West Coast, uh, two cities in the East in terms of Jacksonville, Massachusetts has the Pirates. Their status is a little bit suspect, but there are many along the West Coast scene. Other teams in the IFL include the Quad City Steamers, who play out of Moline, Illinois, the Green Bay Blizzard, the Sioux Falls Storm, who play out of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, the Vegas Nighthawks, who, by the way, have a really clever branding uh, tied in with the Vegas Golden Knights, as well as the AHL's Silver Knights out of Henderson, Nevada. Those are the, those are both teams are related and are owned by the same ownership group that owns the Golden Knights in the NHL. Meanwhile, you also have the Bay Area Panthers out of San Jose, California, the San Diego Strike Force, the Northern Arizona Wranglers who play out of Prescott Valley, Arizona, the Tucson Sugar Skulls, the Duke City Gladiators, the San Antonio Gunslingers, the Frisco Fighters, and the Tulsa Oilers to round out the rest of the Motley crew. All in all, that does bring the league this year to 16 total teams. And keep in mind, they expanded from the year prior. They brought in the Jacksonville Sharks and the San Antonio Gunslingers 
from the National Arena League as two big additions. The Jacksonville Sharks in particular are a massive addition to the IFL simply because they have been around for over a decade. They were part of the AFL 2.0 era, as we call it, uh, 2010 to 2019. Uh, and they had made a namesake for themselves in that sport and made the move just this year after the NAL season concluded where they were the original one of the main two found one of the main two founders of the National Arena League. The Gunslingers joined the NAL 2 years prior back in 2020 back in 2022 made it a season 2 in 2023 and made the jump this year following the Jacksonville Sharks. <laughs> Now, something else to keep in mind with the IFL is that they do have two extra teams that are currently in more of a dormant state that fans have been waiting to see the status of for the 2024 or future seasons of the IFL. First off being the Bismarck Bucks, who did play in the IFL between 2017 and 2022, who had to go dormant last year due to workers' comp issues in the state of North Dakota. Uh, that is still to be determined and has been kind of uh, in the balance, but we will wait and see. Uh, that one last I had heard sounded like it was likely that they would find some point to return. There's also talks that they might be relocating in the future if they have to if they have to find a new place to play. Uh, Fargo has been mentioned in the past as a place for them to call a resident. So uh, a lot of details surrounding them. The other team is the Columbus Wild Dogs, and this one hits me a little personally because back in 2019. When the AFL, then AFL 2.0, collapsed, I had my preferred team as the Columbus Wild Dogs. I lived in Indianapolis, and so that was the closest arena football team I could visit. Now, the Wild Dogs were announced back going into 2020, um, and maybe some of you kind of catch what's going on with that a little bit, uh, as kind of a tribute to the Columbus Zoo with their choice of the African wild dog as the mascot and the naming convention around it. Um, needless to say, been kind of a whirlwind and has been a lot of trouble for that organization getting going ever since. Uh, delays are the name of the game. And if you are in the indoor and arena scene as a fan, you might know of the wild dogs as I would argue more of a, more of a will they, won't they, or it comes up as like an inside joke. Needless to say, they list them still every year as a team that possibly can arrive, and there have been some hints lately that maybe there is a chance we do see them very soon, but for now, they are dormant, which that would bring the IFL to a grand total of 18 teams if these two squads were to make it for 2024. Now, beyond the additions of Jacksonville and San Antonio this offseason, we've also seen during the course of the IFL 2023 season and for beyond a really great addition in terms of a TV deal with CBS Sports Network. Full disclosure, if you haven't been following the iterations of what are indoor and arena football as of now, the common view place to view these games is is on YouTube. Uh, it's not to say that they haven't been on TV before. Hell, the AFL ran on NBC with its own separate set of games from 2002 to 2005. CBS Sports Network has a history with airing arena football games, and even NFL Network has aired arena football games in the past. But what is great to see with this deal is it's the first time in a few, well, really since the AFL, that we've seen CBS Sports or any sports network or television network take interest and put a game on a nationally televised network like this since 2019 when we saw ESPN2 have the Arena Bowl 32 coverage of the Albany Empire and the Philadelphia Soul. Uh, this allows, this deal, has the allowance of the IFL to have three straight championship games on CBS Sports Network, but the real kicker and the one that I think does help this league a ton, and especially in terms of when we talk about stability and we talk about credibility is that additional games can be added as given in the terms of the deal so the ifl might be adding some marquee games onto this schedule as we go forward it should also be mentioned this isn't the ifl's first tv deal if any of you know of stadium uh it is a over-the-air sports network 
uh, that is via your antenna or satellite is also on. It's also on cable and other satellite services. Uh, it's run by the folks, the Reinsdorf family as investment into this. Um, and it's based out of Chicago. The IFL was putting marquee games on stadium last season in 2022. That deal ended. CBS Sports has picked them up and it's an upgrade in the right direction. Uh, as Todd, as Todd Tryon has said in even his own press release on the IFL website, CBS Sports will give our member teams, their coaches and players, the kind of exposure they've earned. As we celebrate our 15th year as a league, this is another example of our continued growth. Now keep in mind, this is going into year 16 of the IFL's history. Uh, year 15 was the last season that we just played. There are two more championship games in this current CBS Sports Network package of games. And again, additional ones can be added. In terms of arena and indoor football, this is a good addition. Now, what I find interesting, though, is to see how people adapt to changing their tastes. Something that's been really convenient is having these games broadcast on YouTube streams. Are they always the best streams? No. Some of them are actually very low quality in most of these leagues. Is it good to be on a network like CBS Sports, who also, by the way, airs Canadian football nowadays, and the Canadians are uh, at least making some solid money per game on that deal. Yes, I think so. And I think in terms of the grand scheme of exposure to the 50 yard game, it's a win. So the IFL has massive wins here. Two of their expansions are very good expansions on the horizon. Things I would say are looking great. My take on the IFL is this personally between the indoor football scene and arena between the two styles of play, I have to be honest with folks, and I've said this all the time, I prefer arena football because of the extra features that comes with it. However, and this is where I will always tell you this and put this out and forward and put my foot first. I love the credibility and I like seeing sustainability. The IFL gets my stamp right there as the top dog right now in the sport. I love the presentation. I love that it is getting at least the concepts of the 50 yard game, maybe not the arena football style, but at least the concepts of arena and indoor are being present in a very professional way. And they have arguably the, if not the top set of teams in the nation, it's a good league. And I think this season they got even stronger with the additions of Jacksonville and San Antonio as a guy that covered the national arena league for two plus years and watch that league. Um, the two consistencies in terms of teams that I could say really were bedrocks uh, in the NAL were Jacksonville and San Antonio. And, you know, they chose to, they chose their way to find a more stable path. Jacksonville in particular, leaving the league they helped create to try and go on their own way. And the IFL is in a really good spot right now. Uh, it definitely deserves that top nod, and you guys should be checking it out. Really check out all three of these leagues, to be honest with you. But the IFL is the one that definitely has a lot going for it and a lot of things I would say you know are going to be there. So that's going to do it for the IFL section. Now, I was just telling you in this video I was going to make this two parts, but the more I do the recording for this, um, I'm going to make this a three-parter because I do think there are grander conversations for each one of these the na the national arena league one itself i really have to get in depth because of the fact so much of what i have seen over the last two years is from my perspective on the nal side of things so come next video here stay tuned you're going to get part two of the which is the national arena league and then we'll have the afl in part three at a later date hey if you like this ifl video if you like my thoughts on it if you want to see more coverage or at least thoughts and opinions on the indoor and arena scene from this channel click the subscribe button and click that bell um i'm just starting out on trying to repurpose this channel this used to be the gridiron gallery podcast and now i'm kind of evolving my content and this is kind of my football my football view but a little bit more in-depth and uh, added bits on the edits if that makes any sense so click the subscribe button uh click the bell if you don't want to miss a video and uh until next time everybody stay tuned football rules the world and i'm glad to be in it